Right. Uh, welcome to the Institute for Government. It's, it's lovely to see you here. And, and uh, the, the quantity of you have come here kind of demolishes the hypothesis that the only reason people come to the RFG is we are the last free glass of wine in Whitehall because we don't do daytime drinking. Um, really delighted you've come here. This is the latest in a series of events we've had focusing on civil service reform at the Institute for Government. And we're delighted to bring you three quite distinctive uh, perspectives today. We're going to start off with uh, keynote speaker uh, John Trickett, MP. Uh, he's uh, shadow, been in the Shadow Cabinet since 2011 as Minister for the Cabinet Office. Uh, formerly uh, Principal Parliamentary Secretary to Prime Minister Brown uh, from 2008. Uh, former leader of Leeds City Council. And John's going to share some emerging thinking and thoughts from, from Labour on what might be their focus for civil service reform. Second up, we have uh, Karen Downs, who uh, really can kind of swing both ways in terms of this discussion. So, used to be an insider, in a nice way, obviously. Uh, used to be an insider as a Deputy Perm Sec in Ministry of Justice, uh, also a Chief Executive of the Legal Services Commission during the uh, not unsubstantial changes to legal aid being, being put through recently. And in her earlier career, Chief Exec in uh, local government and currently the Chief Exec of Open Government Association. So, you get an insider view and a perspective from wider public service. Uh, from Carolyn. And lastly, needing a little introduction, uh, Bernard Jenkin, uh, chairman of PASC, um, and probably the most dogged and persistent pursuer of um, civil service reform, what is it, when is it, and is it going well, and a fairly feisty speech last week um, with the FDA. So I uh, look forward to hearing from all of you. But I'm going to start off with John. Thanks very much indeed. And I was also... Um, working in around number 10 when we first took power in 97 because I was Peter Mandelson's PPS, as you'll hear in a minute or two. Well, look, thanks very much for inviting me and uh, to all of you for coming. Let me start by saying that the British civil service is often celebrated and should be celebrated for its professionalism, independence and its expertise. And although each of those elements needs to be constantly reviewed and renewed, it is right to recognise and pay tribute to the excellence of our public servants. Given the amount of change and churn which the service is experiencing, it's time to recognise not only their professionalism, but also their commitment to a public service ethos. But the British system of governance is under challenge as never before, not only because public expenditure is under unprecedented pressures, but also for a number of other reasons. We now live in a 24-7 society where technological change is revolutionising almost everything we do. We are less deferential and a less hierarchical society. And as a result of the economic crisis, there has been a breakdown in the legitimacy of many of our political structures. And I believe our country is now reaching a turning point the old ways of doing things no longer work as effectively as they once did. And so the civil service has two interrelated tasks. First, they need to demonstrate a capacity to assist in managing the changes which lie ahead in the wider society. But secondly, they will also need to demonstrate a capacity to change themselves to reflect the new world around us. Now, our system of central government rests on twin pillars political and the administrative. And it's been suggested that between the civil service and politicians there exists a symbiotic relationship. Now in common parlance, symbiosis implies mutual interdependence. But in biology, where the term first came from, a symbiotic relationship is one which exists between two entirely different species. <laughs> and not only that, those species may, but equally may not, and frequently do not, operate in mutually beneficial ways, one species to the other. Now, whether or not you're a civil servant or a politician uh, may lead you to a different conclusion, but it may be that civil servants are indeed a different species to ministers. But it, whatever be the truth, it's certainly true to say that there can be an enormous gulf in understanding and culture between the two. You only have to watch Yes Minister to see a brilliant portrayal of this underlying truth. Now, I remember well as PPS to Gordon Brown. It was my first morning helping to prepare him for PMQs. I got there early. 
Uh, fresh shirt and tie. The cabinet room was empty, except for me and a couple of very, very senior civil servants, one with a name which is often in the papers. One of the two approached me and said, look, a difficult situation has just arisen. We've got to tell the PM some bad news. He's keen to impress. That's me. Delighted to help. I readily agreed to brief him. Big mistake. <laughs> Needless to say, and you all know of Gordon's uh, reputation, though I think it's slightly unfair, he did not react particularly well to my first greetings that first morning. And I quickly resolved, I'm a quick learner, never again to give him a problem without at least first trying to find a solution for him as well. I also thought something else. I thought to myself, in future, the civil servants ought to be the bearers of their own bad tidings. <laughs> and so the next time I became aware of a difficult situation, I went to that very same civil servant and I informed him that the PM needed to be aware of this difficult problem. But his response tripped off his tongue with remarkable alacrity. He'd obviously been practicing it. I'm sorry, he said, but we are not permitted to take instructions or advice from polit politicians such as yourself, who is not even a minister. Now, occasionally the differences between politicians and civil service spill out into the public realm. Tony Blair famously said that he, he bore the scars on his back of his attempts to reform the public service. And the current government frequently appears to have reached a megaphone in its attempts to blame the service for one problem or another. But if change is inevitable, and I believe it is, then it ought to be possible, at least at first, to attempt to reach a consensus about the nature and character of that change. And it's for that reason that I very much welcome today's conversation organized by the IFG and also in the presence of the chair of the Select Committee and so many distinguished people who have come. The Select Committee itself can do much to attempt to secure consensus where it's possible. I also note that the FDA have produced a document which signals a clear willingness on behalf of the most senior civil servants to discuss an agenda for change. But my quarrel with the present administration is not that they're insisting on the primacy of elected politicians, nor is it that they have sought to change the way that government works and our administration too, because change is necessary, but it is that they have gone about their task like a proverbial rogue elephant. They set about reducing the size of the service without a rational human resource plan, so that they allowed officials to leave, often at enormous cost in redundancy payments, and then discovered that those skills which had now gone were indispensable, and then had to subsequently to recruit replacements at further cost to the taxpayer, and in the place of a comprehensive reform plan, systematically implemented with clear milestones over a five-year parliament, their reforms have been piecemeal, ad hoc, and occasionally even self-contradictory. With only two years to the election now to go, actually less, they are still rolling out new, disparate, random, and ill-thought-out initiatives. And by doing so, the coalition is in danger of causing a brain drain across Whitehall and a hollowing out, of the, hollowing out of the necessary skills and experience which the country needs and relies on to address the many challenges of today and for the future. It's no way to run a corner shop, let alone a great country. We intend, by contrast, to use the next two years to prepare the ground carefully, if possible by consensus, for the radical change which is needed, and we will then carefully and systematically implement those changes when in office. Now, now, now is not the time in the electoral cycle for the opposition to lay out the detail of our proposals for how government should be conducted. But I will lay out where I think the de debate ought to be focused. So let me start with the famous issue of neutrality. And I'm not referring here to the recent spat of the article about Mrs. Thatcher, which was written by two of our most distinguished senior public officials, though it's obviously preferable if civil servants stand outside, especially of that seniority, of matters of public controversy. I refer to some deeper uh, problems, systemic problems. 
Now, we place a high value on neutrality, but there is an increasing tendency of all governments to open up the civil service to influence from the wider community. The appointment of NEDs is a case in point. No doubt the civil service can only benefit from drawing on expertise and from experience drawn from elsewhere in the country, including and perhaps especially from within the commercial world. But if it's not handled properly, this practice can lead to the perception and maybe even the reality of a conflict of interest, which can then undermine public confidence in the neutrality of the service. So the Public Accounts Committee recently put their finger on an emerging systemic issue. The problem is wider than their recent report, a very damaging, damning report, I thought, on the role of secondments from the so-called Big Four accountancy practices into the Treasury. In a series of written PQs, I established that, there, in fact, there are hundreds of suppliers and goods and services who have passes into departmental premises where they daily rub shoulders with civil servants who have responsibility for handling the procurement and the management of those very same contracts. In a world where almost 250 billion pounds worth of contracts are now managed by our civil servants, the rights of access to and even the embedding of contractors into departments needs to be given careful scrutiny, perhaps with tighter codes of conduct. A related matter is the so-called revolving door, when key decision makers, whether politicians or, or officials, leave their job in government one day and then move directly into the private sector, taking their privileged knowledge with them, which can again leave a perception in people's minds that decisions which were taken when they were in government had been taken in a non-neutral way. We do have the Advisory Committee on Business uh, Appointments, ACOBA, to regulate this phenomenon, but its remit is weak. In France, by contrast, it's illegal for a public official who handles any contract to leave the service and then to enter into the employment of the commercial sector where their knowledge can be helped to guide that contractor's actions. So, still on the theme of neutrality, it's clear that the existence of coalition government itself raises a number of further issues. And as we gradually move into a pre-election period, the civil servants will be working closely and naturally with two of the three main Westminster political parties. But at the same time, they will need to be preparing for the possibility of a change in government. So the issue of pre-election contact with the opposition party in the context of this coalition requires very careful thought. I note that the Institute for Government itself produced a report which recommended three things, really. That the Cabinet Secretary, not the PM, should oversee contact between the civil service and the opposition. That this pre-election contact should be conducted approximately from a period about three and a half years after the previous general election and that it should include all of the permanent secretaries and, crucially, heads of other uh, public bodies. So no doubt the cabinet secretary himself and others will be reflecting on how he intends to secure neutrality and to conduct pre-election contact in this particularly interesting political time with a two-party coalition. If I can just say, I don't know if he's listening or not, if anybody happens to speak to him, we are waiting, we're happy to wait for his, his phone call and um, we'll be pleased to have a conversation with him when he's ready to start that conversation. Turning to the composition of the civil service, the blunt truth is that the most senior levels of the service do not mirror the complex and diverse characteristics of British society in the present century. Whether you look at educational background, class, ethnicity, gender, or disability, the truth is that the service is acutely distorted. This matters for two reasons. First, the service should include the best which Britain can offer. But currently, a whole range of talented people are being overlooked because they come from groups which, to be honest, are effectively excluded from the highest reaches of our service. And secondly, an unrepresentative core can only widen the gap between the governing class and the governed. I've already said that the sense of alienation and dissatisfaction within our country is dangerously strong. 
Take the latest statistics from the fast stream. There are only 10 successful candidates out of 1,290 applicants from Asian, Pakistani, Black African, Black Caribbean, or Chinese backgrounds. Startlingly, only 1.1% of all successful applicants came from a routine or manual worker background. And perhaps most shockingly, of the 159 top civil servants in our country, only five, five, went to a comprehensive school. There are rumours in Whitehall that the next set of stats, which will be produced shortly, will signal a further serious deterioration from an already uh, unacceptable one. Uh, in 1854, Northcott Trevelyan focused on civil service recruitment. It was their first recommendation, actually. Just as it was wrong then that the service was limited to the old and declining class of arist aristocracy, it cannot be right today that the highest levels of the service are drawn almost exclusively from a narrow social elite. The existence of elitism, whether it be through structural process or embedded subconscious prejudice, is unacceptable. Labour will tackle this problem when we achieve office. Now, on another matter but related, the current skills mix in the civil service is an equally vexed problem. There is much discussion about the relative merits of those with specific and technical skills on the one hand and those with generalist education on the other. And I personally do not dismiss at all the contribution of a nimble-minded, flexible generalist capable of putting his or her mind to a wide range of different problems. That's an honourable tradition. Indeed, the service was built from the beginning on people from that background. And even today, almost four-fifths of all the graduates who enter the civil service have a degree in either the humanities or the social services. It's not disrespectful to any of them to inquire whether or not that is the correct proportion. Perhaps it's the present skills mix which explains the frequent complaint that the civil service are more interested in policy formulation and less skilled at policy implementation. It's often said that civil services gold plate regulations making them overly complex, rigid and hard to implement. In any event, the culture, that culture needs to change The, the is also a strong case to say that in some particular areas it's absolutely essential that we strengthen the spe uh, specialist and technical knowledge. For example, project management, procurement, IT and human resources, all of which are areas where the civil service is woefully underskilled. Take procurement just as an example. The shape of this British state is changing before our eyes because increasing number of services are being outsourced. The government buys about 250 billion pounds worth of goods and services. But acquiring value for money and high quality services and goods which are sensitive to the public is a very complex skill. And yet, less than four out of 10 civil servants who deal with procurement are trained to do so. Too often, Public contracts leave the taxpayers' money at risk as a result of inadequate technical skills. Take the disastrous and costly attempt to secure the West Coast mainline contract. Here is a multi-million pound contract, millions of miles of passenger movements per year, designed to endure for, for years. Civil servants were blamed by ministers for the errors, and there were mistakes. But only three civil servants were allocated to handle this complex procurement and no civil servant took charge of the process. In contrast, the private sector would normally expect to employ one staff member per million pounds worth of goods or services purchased. These thoughts then lead me on to the issue of accountability because when something goes wrong, whether it's a contract or some other problem, it's normally the minister who is held to account publicly. It is right that this should be the case in most instances, since, as I said, our system allocates primacy to the democratic rather than the bureaucratic principle. And we should also seek to avoid creating a kind of blame culture within the service whose only outcome, in the end, can be the emergence of a risk-averse 
situation where no one will take responsibility for difficult decisions. Nonetheless, the structure, practices and culture of the civil service should not be constructed so as to obfuscate personal accountability where errors, errors have been made by officials. Now, the existence of a clear, of clear delegation and well-understood hierarchy of decision-taking should be able to help with this question of accountability. Though I have to say, the civil service practice of rotating staff every few months or years at the maximum can often mean that officials are moved on before the consequences of their action have become apparent. Still on the question of accountability, without first properly explaining their reasoning, the present government took the decision to split the tasks at the head of the civil service. It's true that having all the tasks located in a single post proves difficult in recent decades because the complexity of our government structures increased. But it's not clear at all how the present arrangement of an effectively twin-headed operation improves either management clarity or accountability. Northcott Trevelyan's second, I think it was, proposal related to an effective, clear chain of command and decision making. It's clear that was right then and it's right now. But it's equally clear that in the age of Google and the internet, that horizontal communication and networking are frequently used within the commercial sector to drive through flexible working practices and rapid decision making. No doubt the civil service can learn from this and should seize on the, seize on the opportunities offered in a digital age. At the very least, the ancient pyramidal hierarchies need to be urgently reviewed in order to make the service more responsive. And I do believe that new models of organizational structure ought to be considered which equally allow civil servants at every level of the service to play a more innovative and creative role in their work. This would enable more horizontal communication and better service provision to the taxpayer. But the necessity for accountability will mean flatter structures rather than the abandonment in its entirety of traditional management chains. Before concluding, there is one uh, further matter that I want to briefly address, and that's the point at which the political and administrative structures of government most closely intersect. This is in number 10, particularly the policy unit, but not only there, and also in each minister's own private office. I was able to observe at reasonable proximity the manner in which number 10 worked under two very contrasting prime ministers, Blair and Brown. I don't think I'm revealing a state secret if I observe that each operated number 10 in a very different way, and that Cameron, uh, Mr. Cameron is operating in a different way still. He started with a policy group which consisted only of professional civil servants. Now he's employed a large number of SPADs and his policy unit it seems to be overseen by a myriad number of backbench MPs, more almost by the day. Equally, the experience of each minister, minister's relationship with their own private office is very different. Now, in spite of the differences in styles, there may be some generic lessons to be learned, and in particular, we need a grown-up debate about the role of SPADs, who play a key role in the myriad ways in which the civil servants and ministers interact. There is a growing opinion in favour of a European cabinet-style system to secure a more effective delivery of political priorities. Though, speaking personally, I don't believe that that should at all exclude uh, civil servants being a member of that, if that's the direction in which we ultimately go. What is essential, though, is that ministerial and departmental silos are broken down in order to secure more collegiate decision-making. Even within departments, it's often the case that there is little, and it's quite remarkable, communication or coordination under a single Secretary of State between the junior minister's private offices. The disease of departmentalitis, I managed to say it, <laughs> it's a difficult word to pronounce, is the enemy of good government. Similarly, the notion that senior civil servants should not engage in party politicking at the more senior level is a good one. But this should not mean, as unfortunately it sometimes or perhaps frequently does, that the civil service should be politically unaware or worse still, politically disengaged. 
So let me conclude by restating my firm belief that the structures of governance in Britain are under challenge as never before. The country is at a turning point. We will need to exercise both care in our judgments, but then boldness in our actions. In the place of the current system of knee-jerk reactions to immediate problems of the day, what we need is more detailed and indeed forensic analysis of the machinery of government. This should then be followed by strategic change, but if possible resolved by consensus where that's attainable, so that each government does not then simply reverse the actions of its predecessor, or worse still, repeat the mistakes of its predecessor, which seems to be a pattern and a cycle that we've got into. Given the fact that there is still a two-year period before the next election, it's my strong view that we can have an informed debate about how to move forward. Bold government will need governance structures which can facilitate political change if the country is to move forward in new directions which the current difficult circumstances require. Thank you very much. Right, we're going to have about 40 minutes Q&A towards the end, but I'd like to first of all hear from our first respondent, Carolyn Downs. Thanks very much, and I'm um, glad to be here. And uh, just to put on the record, I come from a very working class back background. I am clearly a woman and, um, <coughs> and went to a comprehensive school. So... Um, <laughs> That's three boxes ticked. Yeah, that <laughs> gives a job. Anyway, no. Um, <laughs> So just quickly, um, I thought what I might do is compare and contrast um, what I see as the accountabilities and governance structure differences between local government and my three years in, in central government. And as Peter said in the introduction, I spent um, 15 months within the centre of the Ministry of Justice and then a further uh, nearly two years in the uh, Legal Services Commission, which at that point was a non departmental public body. And I think it's useful in the first instances before going on to reflection to remind, um, I reminded myself of the different and the distinct governance between the two different parts of the public sector. And I think I would always start off wherever by saying good politicians create good officials and good officials create good politicians. And I think that relationship is completely and totally interdependent. But the distinction um, in the governance, um, in the local authority, you are very clearly um, accountable to all political parties and to the council as a whole. Whereas in the civil service, I certainly felt very, very accountable to ministers. And a lot of the relationship with ministers and advice and conversations with ministers were done in private. In a local authority, a huge amount of your business with uh, politicians is transacted in public with your, right, with your advice uh, put in writing into the public arena as well. A local authority doesn't have just one accounting officer, it has three statutory officers, um, the head of paid service whose responsibility for staffing issues, what we call the section 151 officer who has finance accountabilities, um, and the monitoring officer who's the legal um, officer for the council. And I think that creates a system which provides protection to the individual statutory officers, which perhaps the accounting officer in central government doesn't have to the same extent. Just as I generally believe that being able to give your advice in public and in writing gives a higher level of protection to the neutrality and the impartiality of the advice that you are able to give, um, as in, in public. So I do feel that there are some serious strengths in the local government system of governance which gives protections to officials in terms of giving that very robust advice. As a local authority chief exec, I thought my, um, my relationship with the leader was very important, obviously, but my relationship with both leaders of the other two main political parties was fundamentally important as well in terms of the trust that is transacted between politicians and officers. And I genuinely, genuinely believe that uh, the local authority system has a, it, where it works well, um, works on the basis of a shared leadership model between the chief executive and the leader of the council, who both see that as a dual leadership responsibility 
in, in for their council. And I don't feel that that is replicated within the civil service. I think the relationship of permanent secretary and, and, and secretary of state and director generals and secretary of state and ministers is not as close um, as, as in the local authority system. And that comes on to the point which I was asked about at, at uh, Bernard's Select Committee recently about um, the appointment process for local authority senior officers to third tier usually is done by a cross-party group of politicians, not one set of politicians, but cross-party. And that gets a buy-in, I believe, to the appointment of senior officials from politicians across all political parties, not just by one political party. I thought then, just going on to accountability, which John um, raised um, strongly in what he was saying and thought very hard about the different accountabilities and the different roles that I've had. And if I go to being a local authority chief executive, I lived in the local community, my neighbours received our services, my children went to the local schools, um, I drive into work, it was a, quite a large county, you couldn't go by bus, there weren't any, so um, I drive in and I would see fly tip tipping around the area and the first thing I did when I got in in the morning was actually make sure that I rang up the appropriate official about fly tipping, things that were wrong in the local area. So I was absolutely and completely clear that I had that delivery operational focus to make things right and experienced personally the services I was responsible for delivering. My primary accountability therefore in my own view was to the public, very very clearly to the public. My Second accountability, the politicians probably wouldn't have liked this, but was to the politicians of the council. And my third accountability was to the staff. And I was very clear that I had those three distinct accountabilities. And I made sure that the number one one was always to the public. As a chief executive, every letter that came in that said, dear chief executive or dear Ms. Downs or dear horror, or whatever, I, I per made sure that I read them all. I read every single letter that came in to me because I felt that I had a responsibility to read exactly what the public felt about the services that we delivered. Um, when I was at the centre of the MOJ, part of my role was um, to have responsibility for what was called the Ministerial Correspondence Unit, which ministers used to get extremely exercised about the quality of the letters, the timeliness of the letters, etc. But as a very, very senior civil servant, I don't think I see, received a single letter from a member of the public in all the time that I was in the MOJ. And that <coughs> changes your, your, where you feel your focus is, is given. Um, I was very clear about my accountability to ministers, absolutely crystal clear about that. Um, but in terms of my accountability to Parliament, um, even as an accounting officer, I went to um, a PAC just once. Um, as a local authority chief exec, you are in committee with politicians on a daily basis. Um, and in terms of my accountability for my staff, I think I took that extremely seriously within the MOJ. But I don't necessarily think that that was um, the same as everybody else at my level. Um, when I was at the uh, Legal Services Commission, um, I, I was much clearer about my accountabilities, where decisions were made, etc. And I had a much stronger link into Parliament, interestingly, from being in an NDPB than being in the centre of Whitehall, and, um, which I much preferred, actually, in terms of that direct accountability for service, where MPs are constantly getting contact from their constituents. And I thought that made me much more focused, again, on the outcomes for the public in terms of the work that we were doing. Um, and um, I went to the select committee whilst at the, um, at the uh, MOJ and the Legal Services Commission just four times. Now, whilst I've been in my current role at the Local Government Association, I've been to the PAC, I think, five times, and to select committees were there almost daily. So I think that tells you again something about the level of political 
interaction and the difference there is between the local authority and the central government environment. So I'll come on to delivery um, or implementation um, and the difference in the various roles. Now, I have to say that when policy is put together um, in the civil service, the multidisciplinary way in which that is done and the pro pro professionalism which is exercised in putting that together is second to none. So the intellectual, um, the intellectual capability and the rigour which is put into policy development, I, I, I think is outstanding and is certainly not the case in a local authority environment at all. Um, so the very much the, 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 the drive in a council is get it done, it'll do. So you've done a lot of work, you've done your risk assessment, you've put the finances together, it works, it will be fine, get on and do it. And that is very much the culture to which um, we, we operate. And it's not over-intellectualised. In fact, it's not really intellectualised, but it's certainly not over-intellectualised. When I was at the Legal Services Commission, as Peter said, with responsibility for the primary part of putting the Legal Aid Reform Programme in place, um, I, it was a, I felt it was something between the two, actually, between the intellectual rigour of the policy making um, that was there within the MOJ. Though I have to say, sometimes the um, predominance of economists was, um, as opposed to people who can practically deliver, was a little bit frustrating. And, um, but I do feel that there was much more focus about getting things done and that separateness actually with an NDPB I actually thought was very good in terms of the accountability um, to your board. Clear accountability is back into ministers but actually in terms of just getting on and getting things done. I would say however that when you have to have sign a lease for new offices for your staff in Liverpool and to have that signed off by a minister, etc. It seems to me completely and totally bizarre. What on earth are highly paid officials being highly paid for if it's not to make operational day-to-day -day -day decisions of that nature? And I do think that is something that the civil service should reflect on going forward. So some, th some thoughts and solutions um, going forward. I think um, ultimately the protection of independent advice by civil servants to ministers is absolutely fundamental and must be protected at all costs. But I would think, I do think that that system of being more transparent about the advice, how it is given, etc., and the public gaze on that advice could be of help. I do think people obsess about reform of the civil service. And um, the word, you know, we talk about reform of the civil service. I actually think most people are talking about the reform of Whitehall rather than just the, the civil service more broadly. And I actually think it would be much, much more fruitful to talk about the civil service within the context of wider public service provision and wider public service reform and actually really getting uh, to think about working across the public sector in local areas and local communities where people are very much accountable to locally democratic, dem democratically elected politicians. I think it would help if councils and MPs worked together in a way which was constructive and mutually supportive to achieve public service reform in localities. I personally would um, uh, move towards a process of um, political but cross-party appointments uh, I think it works very well in the local government arena. Um, and I think um, the time has come for politicians and managers to be trained together, <coughs> not separately, and so that people are working on a shared and dual leadership form of, of public sector leadership. <coughs> Lovely. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Uh, I'm sure Karen wasn't talking about you when she was talking about obsessed with civil service reform. But, uh, <laughs> Bernard, your response. Um, I'm very struck by the note you ended on, Carolyn, about um, a dual leadership model. And I think the L word, leadership, is the word that we need to concentrate more on and more than anything else. Um, I was so struck by the Francis report into the failure of Mid-Staffordshire. And whilst um, 
maybe you don't expect a senior legal brain to do anything else but come up with a hundred and something recommendations on procedure and legality and monitoring and structures and all this sort of stuff. But to my mind, there wasn't nearly enough about in that report about the obvious failure of leadership in the mid Staffordshire situation. And leadership sometime, some, somehow seems to be um, the absent ghost from the feast of the discussion about how we run our country and how the administrative system is, is working. So I was pleased to hear you say that. Um, John um, started his comments about talking of two tasks for the civil service, both to manage change and to demonstrate the capacity for the civil service to change itself. And I think this is a, a very good um, two, two twin themes which, which are, are good to hold on to. He talked about many of the evident problems we see in our civil service. Um, a failure properly to harness the human resources in the civil service, um, a waste of talent hemorrhaging as a result of unplanned downsi downsizing, uh, the churn at the top of the civil service, the failure to identify um, over a long period. I mean, when we talk about these skills gaps and, um, um, and experience deficiencies that have grown up in the civil service, um, these are not new problems. They're problems that have persisted for a very long time. Um, uh, he talked about a number of things, conflicts of interest, coalitions, questions, and so on, so forth. But I think that the other really interesting thing you invited us to consider, John, is the relationship between the, po the po political and the administrative um, functions. Because never, um, uh, not since Northcote Trevelyan sat and reported can there have been such an extraordinary period where the the, the dirty linen of Whitehall has been washed in public. I'm reminded that when uh, Harold Wilson announced the Fulton Committee to the House of Commons in a statement, he said, uh, and you can just hear him saying it, I wish to make it absolutely clear that no criticism of the civil service is intended whatsoever by the appointment of the Fulton Committee. I mean, you can hardly imagine a minister um, allowing the words, no criticism intended, uh, except um, maybe he was being ironic, <laughs> but at least, he was, at least he was being diplomatic, which is not what we've seen on the front of our newspapers. Um, um, the, um, the whole question of accountability, um, and uh, Carolyn touched on this too, um, and how there is a sense of responsibility and accountability at, in a local government organisation that, um, and I say this with some ignorance, because I mean, I've been a PPS uh, in a government 20 years ago, um, but I've never been a minister. But there is a very strong sense that um, individual officials do not have a firm grasp of what they are responsible for and to whom they are personally accountable. Um, and my favorite example being, um, um, I mean, the procurement piece. When was the last time we ever heard anybody being fired or resigning over a failed procurement project? And yet we know billions and billions and billions have been wasted year after year after year. Um, so there is clearly a failure of accountability, but a failure that is brought about by a system that fails to define people's roles, responsibilities, and tasks, so that uh, even the people in the organization feel it is not their responsibility to take responsibility for an outcome. I'm, I, I, the glass is half full, of course, and uh, there are bits of the civil service that are working uh, very well, and there are bits working less well. But in all this, I think we need to be clear that there is a rising instance of horrible failure in the civil service. I remember when I was um, a new MP and we introduced the Child Support Agency um, and the crisis it created was seen as a horrible aberration. But now, you know, what have we had since then? Uh, 
not only badly handled crises like the foot and mouth crisis, but the Rural Payments Agency, the tax credit system, the failure of the borders agencies, <laughs> qu questions about HMRC not lifting the phones to answer people's questions. And then when you compound it with these human resources failure, now if there's one thing the leadership of the civil service is for, is for managing their own human resources, how is it that we finished up with a system where people have shorter and shorter experience in their own departments and then are moved to other departments where, which they're asked to run, very often with less experience than the Secretary of State uh, actually running that department too? And uh, it is now the case, out of the 16 departments of state, only one permanent secretary uh, remains in post who was in post at the last general election. Four are on their third permanent secretary and therefore have been there significantly less than their secretary of state. And the two of those departments are defense, uh, where we have very difficult procurement problems. And um, in the Department of Transport, is it any wonder that the West Coast mainline fiasco happened when you combine the problems of loss of expertise mm -hmm failure to allocate roles, responsibilities and tasks uh, in, in, with proper definition, failure to uh, make people feel that they are accountable for what you want them to be accountable for. And uh, when it all goes wrong, even though the Cabinet Secretary himself um, uh, checked the process which allocated the franchise, um, uh, it is the civil servant, the hapless civil servant down the food chain that got it in the neck. And it was somebody... Uh, a, a, an outsider rather than an insider, and I better not go any further than that because I think it's sub judice. But um, the question we have to keep asking, and we keep asking in our committee, is why do these things seem to be happening with increasing rapidity? What is the leadership that has allowed this situation to emerge? And to go back to that point John was making, has this system demonstrated the capacity to change itself? Do we think that, um, and we've seen uh, problems in the last government and the problems in this government, do we think that ministers and officials are going to be able to fix this problem as part of the ordinary course of governing the country? And I think uh, the answer to that is likely to be no. Uh, that this does need an external look and John, you finished up by saying we need an informed debate over the next two years and we need to finish up with a consensus. And I invite you to consider that the best way of making sure there is an informed and structured and complete and comprehensive debate about what the civil service is for, what we expect of it, what we expect it to be able to do for our system of government over the next 10 or 20 years, that kind of consideration is long overdue, nothing having happened comprehensively since the Fulton Committee in 1967, which is 45 years ago. Uh, and during that time, think how much has changed. Um, you know, the te technological revolution, the digital revolution, the internationalization of problems and concerns, the internationalization of, of decision making, uh, the effect of the European Union upon decision-making in Whitehall, devolution, um, the change in the nature of our society, the change in the nature of what people expect from their careers, the change in our expectation of what we regard as a fair system of recruitment and uh, promotion, which you yourself touched upon as well. Given all these changes, uh, isn't it extraordinary that the civil service remains as similar it is as it is today. And if I may just finish up on, on two final points. Um, we just received some evidence from a very senior figure who I hope we will pu publish this evidence, but I won't name him until it has been published, who was involved in, um, um, you'll probably guess who it is, um, involved in defence procurement in the mid 1980s and has recently become re involved. Um, <coughs> and in his note to our committee about procurement, it is completely striking how much individuals brought into government at that time changed the system of management and procurement, mm. and then how much it simply reverted to type after they left. Mm. 
And that leads me to the second closing point. We talk a lot, perhaps mistakenly, in critical terms about the, the resistance to change in the civil service. But actually we're talking about an incredibly durable and resilient system of administration. Um, that gift to the 20th century from the 19th century referred to by P Peter Hennessy that's seen us through, through so many crises and world wars and problems. And perhaps what we need to ask ourselves is what we don't need to change in, I see I'm a conservative, which means I, I, I want everything to say, stay the same, but uh, the only things I want to change, I want to change in order that things can remain the same. <laughs> um, um, and maybe we need to approach this institution less with the zeal and anger and frustration of overt reformers, but more with a reverence for the institution of what it's achieved in the past, what it continues to achieve, and what I'm sure it will continue to achieve if it can be husbanded and nurtured, perhaps by a little bit of external debate, direction, and input uh, that it's always had in years gone by. Between Northcote Trevelyan and Fulton, there were no less than eight royal commissions mm. on the future of the civil service, updating and informing <coughs> the original Northcote Trevelyan settlement. And it's that kind of external invigilation of this debate that I think is now timely. Right, we've got about 34 minutes uh, for <laughs> questions. If anyone in the cheap seats uh, wants a question, uh, sort of come and wave at the door. So we'll take questions of sort of twos or threes uh, and see what the panel make of them. So who would like to ask a question or offer a comment? Yep. was the, the uh, division, and, and this is true of local government as of the civil servant, bet bet between the different uh, departments. And it seems to me both the, one of the real challenges over the next few years, uh, a bit disappointed here, not the speakers addressing it, is how we get better cross-cutting uh, working and accountability uh, for, uh, for, for that joint work. I'll pick that up because, John, you did refer to that, so you want to start off with one of that and then maybe... Uh, well, I can... Let me say I was a leader of a council for... Uh, last council, uh, we had 33,000 people working for us for seven or eight years, and in the Thatcher years as well, so they were quite turbulent years. But uh, I was very interested then about trying to reform the service, and it often occurs to me that if you have a child with a problem, often they're in a family which has, a prob which has several problems, in a community, maybe, which has problems, in a, in, a, in, a, in a part of the country which has difficulties as well, frequently. And uh, I thought that the right, and that child, that family, that neighbourhood, that community would be known to a whole variety of agencies, from the school, probation service, library, parks department, the housing, uh, the, the rent collectors and so on and so forth. Each department would know there was a problem with that family or that individual. And I thought, well, I'm going to get all of the service deliverers, so it was assistant director level, because the directors were more strategic, into the same room around a large table and see how they approach these things in a holistic way. And it was an a sta startling moment to discover that they'd never met each other. These were the assistant directors working in separate silos, dealing with human beings facing difficulties in their lives, each department dealing with that problem separately. Now, so the argument that, that we need to deal with communities and the country in a holistic way is one which appeals to me, and it's true to say that departmentalitis, to quote my speech, I did mention it, is the enemy of good government. And look, I think there's a, ra there's a range of issues which need to be addressed here. I've come to say that I don't think it's now is the right time for us to be coming forward with solutions, but we are thinking about this very, very carefully, as I'm sure many other people are too. But what's striking is, when I spoke to uh, ministers and also to the heads of private offices, as I said in my speech, it's quite remarkable that you'd have a single Secretary of State, perhaps with three or four junior ministers, the private offices wouldn't interact. So even if the, the politicians didn't interact, 
It's not surprising that the civil service was also kind of in silos as well. This is a key problem for public sector reform, and I think um, uh, we'll be interested in having conversations about that. Um, precisely how those conversations take place, conservations ta conversations take place, remains to be seen. Um, and we will ourselves, I think, as the Labour Party, be coming forward with some suggestions and ideas for debate in due course. Carolyn, did you see that as a problem? And if so, how would you fix it? Um, I, I, I thought I did refer to it in terms of whole, se whole public sector reform <coughs> in place. And I, 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 I genuinely did feel that actually the civil service is so big that actually making everybody work in a way which is across the civil services is, is a, a monumental challenge. And I just, I genuinely believe if you bring public sector employees together in local places where there is clear <coughs> political and public accountability, that you can work in the way that John has just said, as has happened in the whole place pilot, ha as is happening now with the Troubled Families programme, where you really can start working across the public sector in a community where there is clear accountability. And I think that's the way to do it. So hence me having said, I think you need to talk about the reform of Whitehall slightly separate from the rest of the reform within the context of public service reform. But actually that public service reform needs to take place in local communities. Right, let's take a few more so questions. Can I just do yes, one? Sure, there's a in very interesting question about cross-departmental working. Has it always been the case? <laughs> and some people might say yes, some people might say no, but we have got through, I go back to the point, you know, world wars and economic crises in the past mm. with separate departments. I would suggest, or may I ask the question, is cross-departmental working, or the, the lack of it, um, a problem that is sui generis or is it, in fact, a symptom of deeper problems, a deeper problems of leadership and understanding of what the government's objectives are and how they should be delivered? Okay. But I just asked that question. Okay. Um, Dave and then David. Can you say Hi. who you are, everyone? Yes, Dave Penman, General Secretary of the FD, and uh, thank you for the plug of our alternative white paper, our vision for the future of the civil service. Um, it's interesting that the, the question on the screen behind you um, hasn't really been answered. I think anyone other perhaps than Bernard and he, he helpfully used our conference as a, last week as a platform for saying this, in that he's called for a parliamentary commission to look at uh, a more strategic review of, of the civil service, and I think that's also about the broader public sector. I would like to ask the other panellists whether they would support that as well. The, the, an interesting comment was made at the launch, the parliamentary launch of our alternative white paper, that for the first time, probably since the Second World War, we have politicians from all the main parties uh, sure. who have experience of government. And if now is not the time to try and build that cross-party consensus about how government should operate, uh, when is it? So would they support a more fundamental, whether it's a parliamentary commission uh, or not, a more fundamental uh, review of the civil service and wider public sector that we are calling for as well? And secondly, a more selfish one. Uh, I wonder um, whether the panel agree with uh, the Senior Salaries Review Body that you can't have civil service reform unless you have pay reform. A lot of people talk about problems around procurement and issues around procurement. The, you know, this government and the previous government were simply not prepared to pay the salary levels appropriate to get world-class procurement specialists and that, that problem goes beyond simply specialist roles. So is pay reform linked to civil service reform okay. as well? I'll make sure they answer those questions. David, and then if anyone else has got a question, stick your hand up. David. Uh, David Walker, Guardian Public Leaders Network. Um, what about the civil service itself? It's increasingly anachronistic in an age of devolution, uh, in an age when uh, uh, local government services are clearly connected in all sorts of ways, Caroline's explained, with central. Why an elite formation of the nature of Whitehall? Um, John Trickett's egalitarian ambitions surely could be better realized if we had a move towards a generic fonction publique, as they have in France or like in Germany, where there's mm. a juridical base for a common public service which extends across. I mean, speakers have mentioned in the NDPBs. NDPBs are neither fish nor fowl. If we had a more generic description of the public service, we could begin to better 
uh, achieve this aspiration of joining up. Great. And we had a question down the front here. I'm Mark Kidson. I work at the Institute for Government. Um, as Mr. Jenkins will know, uh, the Fulton Committee was actually regarded by um, its members and others as being somewhat hamstrung by its terms of reference because it wasn't able to look at wider issues of accountability or machinery of government questions. So my question would be um, to all the panellists, if there were to be a commission on the civil service, how do you allow it to look at some of those questions without very quickly unravelling our entire constitutional settlement such as it is? Okay, great question. So the first nice direct question, um, do you support the idea of a Royal Commission or something like it? John? I'm not sure I'm in favour of a Royal Commission. <laughs> but, uh, they take a long time, cost a large amount of money, and they simply don't fit with the, uh, the, with the electoral cycle, which, like it or not, is, the, is, is, is a central part of the, pro, the system under which we live. And I think we all do like it because we are proud of our democracy. So, though, the second question, do we need a fundamental review? And yes, I think we do. And uh, it would be better to attempt to, uh, as I've already said in my speech, move towards consensus. And it, it, there's a, an interesting proposal, which is not quite a royal commission, as I understand it. I think, I think you were talking about a parliamentary commission, which might have a shorter time scale, which would involve the politicians, I guess, directly, and could take. Um, witness, uh, witness statements from um, a variety of people and no doubt would have the direct input of former ministers. I mean, look, it's for Parliament to decide and not for politicians, ministers or shadow ministers to tell Parliament how to conduct I its business, particularly when it comes to select committees which are there to review the work of the executive. Um, but, uh, as I've made it quite plain, plain I think there needs to be a wide-ranging conversation amongst all the key actors, including politicians, civil servants, and the recipients of the service, which we mustn't forget why we're here. We're here to serve the country and the people. And if Parliament decides to proceed with a parliamentary commission, which would be a commission of both houses, I understand it, um, no doubt they would have a thought to the electoral timescales. So I think it will be interesting if that were to develop. It's not for me to tell Parliament uh, what to do, given my position as a member of Shadow Cabinet. But in any event, I know that the IPPR are about to produce a report, which I hear some interesting things about, and no doubt that will stimulate a debate as well. The key thing is that we find a formula which allows a, a widespread conversation, uh, thoroughgoing and comprehensive. From our point of view, as politicians seeking to serve the country in government, we will want to see uh, the beginning of a consensus emerging and we will be making proposals according to the electoral cycle. And I think that's where any political party will say uh, it wants to be where it is. As to whether or not the question of pay and remuneration, all I'll say at this stage is, look, we're in a very, very difficult financial situation. Fiscal. Uh, situation is, is very tight now and heaven knows what it's going to be like in two years time and very difficult decisions are being taken about public sector pay which none of us I guess uh, would make um, if it wasn't for the constraints which are upon us. Has it produced some anomalies? Yes it has. Um, are those anomalies making the process of administration more difficult? Well of course they are. But It seems to me that the, the key question facing the country at the moment is resolving the fiscal crisis and I think the wider discussion about how you begin to address those anomalies over time is something which can take place around a discussion uh, which I'm trying to stimulate by my speech uh, this lunchtime. So Karen, quick answer, you like a good inquiry and what about pay reform? <laughs> um, I don't know whether I would support um, a Royal Commission to be absolutely honest. Um, I think there's been so many inquiries, you kind of wonder what the terms of reference would be that would make this one different and, and make it happen in the way that the other, others haven't. I think if there was one, I think one of the things that really would need to be asked is why have all the different uh, reviews to date not been implemented in a way that people think is satisfactory. Um, in terms of pay reform, yeah, I'm kind of on your page on this one. I would be, wouldn't I? Um, but I do think, to be absolutely honest, we've got to the point... Um, 
I, I, there was some need to redress public sector pay, which had got somewhat out of control, but you can go too far. And when people talk about brain drains, I think some of it is pay related as well, and we need to think about that. Um, and that's not just in the civil service. Um, and uh, the um, other issue about, I thought that was a really cracking question in, in terms of constitutional settlement um, and if you start on picking it all, I think if you did do that, if you did go down that route, you would need to think about what is precious constitutionally that you would wish to keep and then I think it would come back to my starting point is that when you find out what is con precious that you want to keep, the issue is why have all the reviews in the past not been implemented? Bernard, are you itching to follow up on Mark's question as well? Well, yeah, well, just briefly on pay reform, um, I mean, it is striking that the principal argument in favour of a GOCO in the Ministry of Defence is to be able to employ people on much greater salaries than mm. is allowed mm. in the public sector. Um, if that really is the principal reason, why, why are we going through this elaborate process of, mm. of outsourcing this huge yeah. function yeah. with Absolutely. so much public yeah, yeah. liability, which requires to be... Uh, um, um, to be uh, accountable, and which will still require government to be to have that knowledge and understanding of what they're buying with this vast sum of money. I mean, I just I think that is an example of where um, we may be throwing out babies and bathwater yeah. instead of understanding what the fundamental problem is. With regard to, I, I don't think I need to answer David's question, except to say that yes, quick, agile, um, democratically accountable. These are all the virtues of a parliamentary commission as opposed to a royal commission. Um, but to deal with Mark Kidson's point about remit, um, the Pandora's box is already open. Mm. Um, we had um, Lord Wilson of Dinton, former cabinet secretary, appearing <coughs> before us, complaining about one of the proposals in the civil service reform plan was a return of patronage. He used the word patronage in terms of the uh, changes proposed for the appointment of senior civil servants. And uh, personally, I think we have a good constitutional settlement in this country, and we do need to recognise that one of the great institutions which underpins our constitutional stability <laughs> is our permanent civil service. Mm. But unless this is a question which Parliament is collectively and consensually mm. prepared to put its voice behind, then uh, ministers or other pressures are going to carry on gnawing away at this settlement. So I think um, you, you're making an argument in favour. If you're saying that this is a matter of the highest constitutional importance, you're making an argument in favour of this kind of comprehensive review about what the civil service is for, what its primary purpose is, what we want it to look like, and then how it should be achieved. And the one thing about the Fulton Committee, you're absolutely right, it wasn't allowed to look at the, look at the relationship between ministers and civil service, to servants. I wonder why. Um, <laughs> but there is, um, um, there is a relationship that was so private then and is now so painfully exposed mm. today. I mean, if there was ever a reason for a parliamentary commission to look at something, it's the relationship, the very, very difficult and some often untrusting and painfully exposed relationship that now exists between officials and their civil servants. Um, oiled or not by the role of special advisors. Um, but uh, the, I was going to say something else that's gone out of my brain, but, but I think you've made an argument in favour of a parliamentary commission, not against it. Okay. <laughs> Karen, can you, can you briefly stress David's point, which was uh, you know, against yeah. an elite civil service, yeah. what about a common yeah. public service cadre? Uh, I, I would absolutely be in favour of David's uh, idea about the um, fonction publique, if one wants to call it that. Um, I, I, I do think, however... Sounds that like the triumph of the administrative class to me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we like that. Well, <laughs> but, um, that's, but that's what the French system is, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, but I do think, it is a, I think it's a great idea. Um, we have constantly talked about secondments across the public sector for years and years. It's never really happened fundamentally and systemically in the system. So oh. I, I, do think that, I do think it would be a significant uh, move forward. And, and again... That is why I keep coming back to the issue of in place, because it would be so much easier to do it in local areas than do it as a national monolith. So the more I think we, the more we need to think about place if we want to make change. Great, I've got uh, three questions. Can I start with you? Thanks. 
Um, Susanna Brecknell, Civil Service World. Um, speaking about broadening understanding across the public sector and implementation, or improving implementation, I wonder what the panel think of the reports in the weekend papers um, about senior civil servants in the Department of Health being required to spend 20 days a year um, working on the front line. <laughs> Is that a sensible move? Lovely, thank you very much. Gentleman there. Uh, Alan Ruddock, Horizon Scanning Limited. I used to work at the um, Foresight Unit within um, the Government Office for Science. Uh, just listening to these, uh, some of the uh, uh, reflections towards the end there about what the, the inquiry or the commission would be for, uh, and the sort of limits on remit, I, I wonder whether actually um, an inquiry is, is, is the sort of thing that, that is going to be able to unlock some of these difficult issues here, because as soon as you put it into this kind of a format, um, uh, even if you have a fairly wide base and, and, and people coming into it, it seems to be, it seems likely to be tied or to be referring to structures which are, are, are still quite powerful around it. And surely before we get there, uh, we need to, I mean, what, what I hear very little of actually is, is some sort of a long-term vision. I think um, Bernard was, was referring to it to some extent there. But if we are really to get beyond the kind of political side of this, and frankly, the build up to the next election, it's not going to be that easy to get people to come together on this, I don't think. Don't we need sort of to work with a very wide group, including the public, to look 10, 20 years forward to think where we might want to get to, which then, of course, it leaves the difficult job of thinking that the stages we get there in, but at least we can have some common consensus where we get to, um, uh, even if we're not going to have, have the action um, plan immediately for it. Then people can refer, could refer back to that. Good, and take another two, and then we'll get some, Jonathan, and then I'll come to you. Uh, Jonathan Paul, after about 30 years in <laughs> central government. And uh, just, uh, just an observation on pay, by the way. If we align civil service pay with that in local government, we'd solve all of the problems <laughs> <in the government. laughs> straight away. And as to David's French uh, model, the, um, I, I'm not sure about the French, it's probably the most elitist system exactly. Mm, exactly. anywhere in the Western world. I, I don't think it's a model for anything, frankly, but that's uh, uh, part of the debate. I also just sort of, I, I do think you can over uh, romanticize the successes of local government, which is when it's good, it's very good. When it's bad, it's pretty awful, really. Mm -hmm. And actually, when you spend 15, 20 years with the same political leaders and the same officers, you could describe it as close. You could also describe it as very cosy. It's a very different environment. But it does raise questions about, I want to raise about, A, about accountability. Because there does seem to be a broad problem across the public sector about accountability. Local government, I don't think, offers much of an example. We've seen Oxfordshire County Council, where young girls were being tortured uh, and raped for over a decade. The county council stood by. Not a single individual in that council has so far accepted responsibility or resigned. I, I think that's completely outrageous and, and I'm, not I'm sorry, the case. but that is... You, the, the just, just on that point, the chief yeah. executive of Oxfordshire County Council and indeed... Uh, the the uh, the chief constable of police have both stepped up and, and been apologized. interviewed and apologised throughout. It. And and sorry, Jonathan. And actually, it was only last week I was actually commenting about that level of accountability, where the chief executive of a local authority is on the national press being pilloried for something, and that shows to me a ha much higher level of accountability than I've ever seen in the civil service. I'm, and I'm sorry that you've been so adversarial about it, but, and I wasn't going to raise that in my introduction, but that's a much higher level of accountability I'm than sorry, ever I've 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 represented seen. people in the civil service who've put up with that kind of thing on a regular basis. I'm sorry, it, it is not accountability in a meaningful sense, nor are there any political leaders speaking out in Oxford, unless it's happened at a very local level. I've represented people who've been right there in the front of the national papers, day after day, doorstepped, uh, and their families had to go into <coughs> hotels and the rest of it to cope with the pressure. And this is not, on by, this happens every few months to a civil servant in some part of the civil service. There is a real issue though of accountability across the public sector. In the civil service, the problem is it relates in particular to the role of politicians. And it comes back to the question of the constitutional settlement. I'm not sure how you can open up the question of accountability for civil servants 
without revisiting the whole issue of accountability of ministers and senior okay, politicians. I'll, I'll take so why does that, can I, just a final point. Quick. Uh, it's part of the problem, actually, we are underestimating the scale of the problems now facing central government. And what we need is actually the debate all the parties are slightly shying away from, which is that bigger question, what is the role of the state? What are the role of public services? What is it that the state and therefore the civil service could look to be doing actually realistically okay. over the next 15 to 20 years? Thanks, Jonathan. Years? Final point in this, this uh, round of questions. David Simon. Institute. Uh, Bernard asked us a question and then conveniently answered it, which was very useful. Was, was have we been worrying about joined up government for a long time? The answer is yes. I worked with Richard Wilson for three years on a large paper on joined up government. But I think it, your, your response to your own question was the, the vital element of this, which has just been touched. If you're going to one tribe, and now we've got split leadership, which in my view will go for incremental change because that's how our system best changes. It's not a revolution. It will be an evolution. But it will be totally gummed up and in my view less effective if you go for reform in the political wing. There is no good looking at one tribe here when we know we've got two. If the political tribe doesn't come to terms problem and challenge of silo mentality and accountability through Parliament, you will never get joined up government and you'll never get synchronised reform. You will get two types of incrementalism which will just continue to stand. Great, thank you very much. So, Karen, do you want to pick up that, that question about um, bedpans for senior civil servants? Yeah. Um, we used to, um, I, I used to ask colleagues um, in social services, etc., whether I could go and uh, be on the front line with them. And the general consensus was actually you just get in the way. And I think there's a, a happy medium um, uh, in terms of, you know, having that connection to the front line and how you do that or pretending to be uh, mopping beds, etc. So I think there is a, hap a happy medium in all that. I've never really understood why an IT officer really needs to go and do some of those kinds of, uh, of, of front line activities. So I think it's, um, in general, it's a good idea, but I think there is a happy meeting. That's four weeks of the year to take somebody out of their job, and that would, to me, imply that actually they're not very busy. Okay. Um, how about this question on long-term vision? I mean, maybe both, both John and Bernard would like to pick that one up. You know, well, where's a long-term vision? Do we need one? Well, I think this is um, uh, what the government admits is... I mean, not, not admits, they perfectly accept that the Civil Service Reform Plan does not purport to be a strategic document, does not purport to set out what the civil service is for from you know, fundamental principles, which is why we need to develop that long-term perspective, which I think was the focus of your question. And you're asking, you know, is an inquiry the right thing? Is the format... That, it depends how the inquiry is set up and, and who's on it, but I do very much think that such an inquiry needs to be more about... Private com well, as much about private conversations and a building of consensus and private understanding mm. as about public evidence sessions and cross-examination and all that. Because it's about reaching a shared understanding, not of, I mean, so much conversation is about what reforms shall we do? What, what are we going to do? What we need to do is, first of all, share an analysis of what has gone wrong or what is going wrong, because I don't even feel there's a consensus about this in, our, in this room. Can I just pick up on this 20 days per year in the front line? I think this is absurd. <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> it, it's one thing for a maybe a senior civil servant in the Department of Health, as part of an act of leadership, to go yeah. and demonstrate empathy and understanding with people on the front line, mm. to show that that person does have the experience and understanding, uh, to in, to engage with those people and understand what they're feeling in order to impro improve the process of leadership. It is shutting the stable door after the horse has bolted if you're panically educating people <laughs> who should have had that experience long before they reach these senior positions. And I think it just underlines what is wrong. I mean, it's an act of wanton self-ingratiation or... Um, 
or, or ministers pandering to the prejudices of, 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 and the happinesses of people on the front line instead of addressing the fundamental problems. But I'd love to come back on the two other comments as well, if I uh, have a chance. Did, John, did you want to add anything on the long-term vision point? Well, we speak about the civil service. And if you want to make a speak about everything, a speech about everything, it's going to take several hours. Um, the truth is, this, as I said in my speech, the state is changing shape before our, our eyes. It's quite dramatic what's happening. And um, it's not clear that the way in which that reshaping is taking place was a product of any single mind or group of minds kind of working out where we want the state to be and what it, we want it to look like, say, by 2020. And in terms of, for example, public sector reform, the relationship between public sector agencies or taxpayer-funded agencies, because many of them are now private, and the individual uh, is a key debate to have now. The government, which I was, was a part of on two separate occasions, and as I described earlier, tended to use markets or targets. I don't think any, uh, I, I wasn't really in favor of either of them particularly. I voted against much of the marketization because it seemed to me that some of these services tend towards monopoly. If I represent 23 villages, uh, there's no bus services particularly uh, linking one village to the other. And, and it's slightly outlandish to suggest that the individual citizen can choose between uh, schools when there are only four schools uh, uh, for 23 villages across a huge area with no, no buses interconnecting and many people without access to a private car. So the idea that you could have competing schools for a marketplace didn't seem to me to work. It probably might work in London, I don't know, but it certainly didn't work in my patch. And then top-down targets, again, I think, uh, uh, founded reasonably quickly. But at least one could say that there was a conception of the kind of reforms which the public service should be submitted to in order to drive up uh, standards and quality. It's hard now to see if there's a single theme behind public sector reform. And without that, it seems to me that you'll get a series of, I described it, ad hoc, pragmatic, off-the-cuff decisions whenever a decision is emerged. And that's where I think we have uh, degenerated to in, in uh, recent months and the last couple of years. Um, so there needs to be a big debate about the kind of the state we want, and I've got a clear personal uh, view, about how services should be provided to the citizens, and within that, how the public service employees should conduct their business. But it seemed to me that wasn't the debate of, uh, that wasn't the subject of today's discussion. It was more about the civil service. And I try to indicate within that my views about the broad areas where we need to be having conversations about, about the civil service. Okay, can I just get a very quick reaction to David Simon's point about what about the political reform? Maybe Bernard, um, I think, I think very briefly, because I want one more question. Sure. My Lord, you're absolutely right. It's that the politicians have got the civil service they deserve. And uh, part of the reason for involving politicians in this consideration and get making, making the politicians face up to this consideration is to get the politicians to understand that uh, we as a class are responsible for the way the civil service now performs or does not perform because of the way it's been husbanded by a few generations of politicians. And just very briefly, we've uh, you know, there should be a benign circle uh, of um, leadership from senior officials and ministers uh, leading to successful, um, at the, at, at, say at the policy end, leading to successful implementation, uh, feeding back through a reporting structure that um, informs and reinvigorates the policy and implementation. What we have is um, uh, um, a, a, a culture of instruction, of orders, and that there shall be delivery, <laughs> and then there shall be performance management, and the performance never matches uh, what has been expected because uh, the, the relationships have been turned into, frankly, what is too transactional and too, um, too, uh, um, too devoid of that human element upon which real, true leadership depends. And if I can just comment on this, very interesting, but if I may say so, and we all do this about accountability, 
But if we finish up having a row no, about, wh about which systems are more accountable, because my system's more accountable than your system because more people get shot when things go wrong, yeah. I mean, I think this is a potentially very destructive. Yeah, great. What we should be asking ourselves, what does it feel like to be accountable? And how does that feeling translate into positive working relationships with the people you're attempting to work with? And this goes to the cross-departmental point as well. Why, do, why, has it, why has the silo mentality, which is deeply embedded in the culture of departments, and uh, individuals in many departments, why has that culture become so embedded? And it's something to do about power, and it's something to do about um, taking, you know, who's got power over your career. And I'll just, may I just <laughs> one more comment. Literally 30 seconds. <laughs> most people in a failing organisation, this is evidence we have taken, most people in a failing organisation know it is failing. Mm. They just don't know how to talk about it. What do we need to do to the feeling of accountability and for the feeling of responsibility in the public service so that people feel freer to give the information, truth to power, give the information to the people who make the decisions so they can make better decisions? Okay. That's the problem. Carolyn, very briefly. I'll let form. you go on to another question. Actually. Sorry. Uh, I'm so sorry. sorry. No, we haven't got time for another question. I'm going to ask you for a final comment and then John. Oh, right. Well, I, I, I would like to en endorse that point. I, I, I genuinely believe that... Um, most people in the public service are here because we really want to yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, improve and change the quality of other people's lives. And I think the minute that we start falling out, the minute, actually, to be honest, it, the, the part, it, it's over. So I really do think that people in the public service generally should pull together. And I think the other thing we need to recognise as well is that never has there been a more difficult time ever to be working in public services than right now, and that we need to be supportive um, to each other and of each other at a time, and that's politicians and officials collectively, and in that, I genuinely think the sooner we get towards shared leadership across the whole of the public service, then we'll be in a much better place. John, the last word. Let me just very briefly then say, I, I'm not sure if I entirely agree with what you said about politicians. But I, I think what's required is absolute clarity from politicians about objectives so that civil servants know precisely what's expected, uh, clear leads given, and um, that we then work to a single objective, um, which is stayed through by the politician, which the civil service uh, understands. What I think has been missing, and that often can, uh, not always, but can often be the case with ministers, they can be reasonably clear, often, about, um, I don't want to be too defensive about the political class, about what they want to achieve. What politicians, it seems to me, have failed to do for a generation or more <coughs> is, to pay, is to pay particular attention to the machinery of government. And uh, if the machinery of government isn't quite right, and it isn't, <laughs> then clarity about objectives defined by politicians will not result in, in clear decision making and clear uh, political implementation. So I wanted this debate, and it has, I'm pleased that it has taken place in the way it did, to begin a conversation, or to be part of a conversation, about how precisely we can f fine tune the machinery government in order to de deliver, because let's be clear, I said absolutely specifically in these terms, this country cannot go on in the same way. We have reached a turning point. And that will mean, I think, big change. But if we don't have machinery which can deliver the change, then it will not happen. And I think further disorientation, alienation, and disconnection from the political system could at that point be very dangerous. Great. Thank you all very much for coming. Our next Good event will be early mm -hmm. July, looking at right. Silso's yeah. form plan one year on. How's it going? Yeah. Uh, but many thanks to our most excellent panel, and hope to see you again soon.